All right, so the subject matter tonight, we're going to get into Hebrews 1 a little bit later in the passage. It's just the kind of the main passage that we're going to be dealing with tonight. But the subject matter I'm going to be preaching on, I actually wanted, I intended on preaching a sermon on angels and demons. But as I was preparing, there's so much, there's so much content in Scripture just on angels alone that we're going to be, I'm going to be teaching all about just angels, who they are, what they are, what the purpose is, and just kind of give just basic teaching on this. I can't recall, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure there's, there's not a whole lot of preaching that goes on just about angels. I, I can't remember listening. I'm not saying it's not out there. I just, I haven't really heard many sermons about this. But for how many times you read and see about angels, I mean, I think just doing like a word study, and I, did, I don't have the exact number or anything, but I want to say there's over 300 references to angel, angels, whatever, you know, throughout the scripture. And one of the reasons why I want to bring this up is just because, first of all, there's a lot of false information out there. What people have a tendency to just know about angels or spiritual things, but especially when it comes to angels, things like that, probably primarily will come from the Catholic Church. Just what the world knows, what maybe even your average Christian knows that isn't really in their Bible. You see Hollywood movies, and most of Hollywood gets their information from the Catholic Church. That's kind of just, you know, if, they, if someone's making a movie and, and they just want to make some generic whatever, they're going to go with teaching of Catholicism by and large in general for whatever they're trying to do. So um, I kind of want to dispel some of the, the false information that's out there, but ultimately I'm not really bringing up specific false teachings about angels. As much as I'm just, we're just going to go through a bunch of passages in Scripture and just kind of identify as much as we can about who the angels are. And, and you know, I'm going to close with a point that I think is, is just really encouraging for us to know that angels exist. See, people will often criticize Christians for believing in things that you can't see. Well, I mean, that's what faith is anyways, right? Faith is, is believing in, in that which you can't see. And just as much as we believe in Jesus Christ, can you see Jesus Christ physically? No. Are we trusting him as our Savior? Yeah. Do we believe the Bible? Do we believe he's the Son of God? Do we believe you know, everything the Bible says about him? Of course. I believe everything that's written in the Bible. People, you know, will, will scoff and mock. I believe that, that unicorns are real. I believe, you know, when the Bible talks about a unicorn, it's real. And other beasts and other things that someone else might, might scoff at. If the Bible's talking about it, folks, it's, it's real. It's legit. It, it doesn't matter if some of these things are still in existence today or whatever, but when the Bible talks about it, it's true. So when the Bible's talking about angels and devils, first of all, there's way too many references, angels and devils, for this just to be some metaphor, right? Just to be some, it's, it's spiritualizing some other truth but they're not really actual beings that are angels. No, there's actually a lot of information. We're going to see some of it tonight about just real, literal creatures. But the Bible says in Colossians 2.18, you have to turn there. You could stay in Hebrews. We're going to, I'm going to be flipping around a little bit, but uh, I, have, I have a lot of notes. There's a lot of subjects, so I don't want to keep us here real late, so I'm going to kind of fly through some of this stuff. But you could take notes if you want. Colossians 2.18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. There's a lot of people who just, I mean, they don't understand anything about angels, but this is referring to people who would, you know, worship angels. And we are not to worship angels. And we're going to cover a verse where even the Apostle John, you know, falls down on his face in, in, when he's getting this revelation of future events and things like that. And he's talking to an angel and the angel's like, no, get, get up on your, off your feet. You know, get up on your feet. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like you, right? Don't, don't worship me. We're not to be worshiping angels, but there's a lot of religions that will elevate status of angels and, and make idols out of angels and things like that. So um, the Bible warns about that. So that's why we're going to go through some of this right now. Now, just the word angel itself literally just means a messenger. And you think of the word evangelist and evangel 
it, it's got the word angel kind of tucked away there in the middle in the middle of the word. The, an evangelist is a bearer of good news, right? He's, he's someone who's preaching the gospel. He brings glad tidings of good things. That's what an evangelist does, and he's bringing the message of salvation um, to, and, that, and that's kind of part of the root of that that word there. And before we get too deep here. Now, when the Bible references, just uses the word angel, there's a few different references that can be used or could be applied to the word angel. Sometimes it can just be talking about another human being, as I already mentioned, like a literal human being, not a different spiritual type of a creature, but someone who is just a human that is an angel. Why? Because they are a messenger. One example of this, and, and you may have a different understanding of this, and that's okay, Revelation, when, it, when the Bible talks to all the different churches, it says, unto the angel of the church of, and then lists off the seven different churches. I believe that is for the pastors of those churches, that these messages are given to the pastors, to then, and, and it's referring to them as angels. Revelation 1.20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. You disagree with me on that, that's fine. There's another reference I have here though in Revelation 22, verse number six, the Bible says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things. This is at the end of the book of the Bible. The end of the, the whole you know, book of Revelation, the last chapter, verse 8. I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. So he hears all this stuff, he sees this stuff, and I mean, he's blown away, right? He's getting all this stuff revealed to him so much that he just falls down to worship the angel that was there showing him these things. And then verse 9 says, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. So I'm just like you. And of thy brethren the prophets. So he's not just a fellow servant in the sense that they both serve the Lord, but one's an angel and one's a human. He's saying, no, I'm just like you, and I'm one of your brethren, the prophets. I was a prophet just like you. And of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. You say, no, worship me. So it's again, and, and you know, you can go through, and like I said, there's hundreds of references to angels. So just kind of pay attention to context when you're reading the Bible, if you want to do a, your own study on this, that you understand these things. Um, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 2, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So again, some people didn't even realize they're, they're entertaining strangers. They're, they're being hospitable and bringing people in. They didn't realize that they're angels. They just thought that they're just men walking. Do you think of um, Abraham, when you've got the angels that were going down to Sodom to, to see if it was really as bad as, as what was heard. You know, you know the story in Genesis 19. And he stops and says, hey, come, you know, sit down right here. We're going to make a meal for you, you know, and, and he's being real hospitable to him. I don't think he knew that they were just angels, at least definitely not right away. You know, he'd, he'd invite them in, everything else, and he has a conversation with the Lord and, and you know that whole story. But um, also, I believe there's also references, and we went through this because we're going through the book of Judges, of an angel being Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ can be called an angel. You will find references to that in Scripture. And sometimes it's actually a little bit difficult to tell if it's talking to, you know, the angel of the Lord. Is this talking about Jesus Christ talking to someone or just another angel? It's not always clear. Um, but the, we, the example we went over in, in the book of Judges was Judges 2, verse number 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Speaking first person, I did this, not thus saith the Lord, but I brought you forth and I said this. And this was a human form speaking, which is the Son of God an Old Testament appearance and, and being referred to as an angel. Um, 
And then in Hebrews, flip to Hebrews 2, you're in Hebrews 1. We're looking at Hebrews 2 because we also have references as a, of angels as separate creatures. Just not, hu not, not a human being, not a man, not Jesus Christ, but a completely different creation of God. And I think this, is, this may be the majority of references, but um, you need to be able to tell from the context. We're, Hebrews 2 definitely is talking about this. So look at verse number 5. The Bible says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. So he's talking about the millennial kingdom. He's talking about the future events. He's saying he hasn't given the angels um, the world to come. Like they're not going to be ruling and reigning in that time. He said that he didn't give that to the angels. Verse 6. But, but see, we know that as believers in Jesus Christ, we will be ruling and reigning with Christ. We are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. So there's definitely a distinction here between these angels and other people, even men that you might call an angel, uh, because they're delivering a message. Verse number six, but one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedst him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now jump down to verse number 16. The Bible says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Very clear distinction. He didn't take on him the nature of angels, that physical nature of being, you know, in the form of an angel, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. So very clear distinction between a human being and an angel there, and that we're talking about a separate type of a creation. And we already saw in Hebrews 2, but even in 2 Peter 2.11, the Bible says, whereas angels which are greater in power and might. Angels are, are stronger beings, just, just physically. Even, it was really interesting because they're spirits, right? But they are stronger and more powerful than human beings are. Angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation, accusation against them before the Lord. And you can read the context of that. But I just want to point out that they're, they're powerful beings. We're made a little bit lower than the angels. Angels are, are a mightier being than, than we are. Um, keep your place here. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 10. So there's another reference that can use the name angels in Scripture, and, but they're not always called an angel, and that's a cherub or cherubims. And I'm going to read for you from Exodus 25, which basically um, is describing the tabernacle and the ark, where the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat are, and there's cherubims that were there with their wings touching each other, overlooking the, the mercy seat. So the mercy seat was in between these, these cherubims. And um, this is another one of those things where if you look at, at art, and especially a lot of the Catholic art and stuff, you'll see these little tiny like baby faces with the little wings and maybe a halo, maybe not, whatever. But they'll, they'll, they'll call that like cherubims. But I, when I look at scripture, I don't see the little baby face picture. Now, you will find some, some aspects that are true, but I, I think that interpretation of what these beings are is just completely false. You could even go through, and I didn't do this here, but um, there's a lot of measurements given and things like that. They're not these little tiny baby creatures. Uh, but Exodus 25, 18 says, And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shalt you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof, and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look 
one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. So here we've got creatures with wings. Obviously not human beings. They, they literally have wings. And uh, these are referred to cherubims. Now, the reason why I say that a cherub is also considered an angel, you're in Ezekiel 10, if you want to just, again, hold, hold a place there. Ezekiel 28 refers to Satan as being a cherub. And we know that Satan is, a, is also called an angel. And next week, I'm planning on going through devils or demons, whatever you want to call them, because there's, there's just not enough information or there's too much information to pack it all into one sermon. So I'm covering angels this week. We'll cover devils and demons next week. But, um, so we'll probably hit this again. But e Ezekiel 28, verse number 12, the Bible says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum of wisdom and perfect and beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So at this point, we know this isn't just talking about that, that physical king at the time, the king of Tyre. He's going all the way back to Eden. He's like, you've been in Eden. Well, who was in Eden? Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Okay, that's, that's who we have in Eden. In, in Eden. Edom, not, not Edom, Eden. Because Adam and Eve get cast out before anyone else is there, before the king of Tyre comes along. So... Um, it says here, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. This is Lucifer. This is Satan. This is the devil who God created him beautifully, wonderfully, and, and he set him up to be perfect in his ways. And, and he was the anointed cherub until iniquity was found in him until he sinned, and then he lost his position. Um, but notice he's called the anointed cherub, and he's, he's being referred to as a being that is a, a cherub. And um, we see in, in another passage, we could cross-reference this, where Satan is also called an angel of light. And, and we'll cover that a little bit later, next week. Uh, next week. But, um, and this goes on and on. We're not going to read through all of that. Uh, flip back to Ezekiel chapter 10 because we're going to see a much more detailed description in Ezekiel 10. And this is something, if you're interested in the subject, you can go back and reread later. We're going to kind of read through it quickly because, like I said, i got a lot of information I'd want to try to get through. Ezekiel chapter 10, we're going to see physical descriptions of cherubims. Verse number one, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen, and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house, when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. So they're making this, the, the, the wings are making a really loud sound if it is being compared to the voice of the Almighty God. And we could see other passages, the voice of Almighty God is a voice of like many waters. It's just this really loud, like powerful voice that you hear. And that's the sound that's being made by these, uh, the wings of the cherubims. It said, verse six, and it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen saying, take fire from between the wheels, from between the cherubims, that he went in and stood beside the wheels and one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen 
who took it and went out. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone. And as for their appearances, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked, they followed it. They turned not as they went, and their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel, and everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third face, the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. And the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Kibar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. When they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And you can read the rest of this. This may sound a little bit confusing because there's a little bit more going on here that, that's being described than just what a regular cherubim looks like because there's another creature kind of in the midst here with the wheels and everything else. But one thing I want to take away from this and one thing you'll find throughout Scripture is that cherubims are used to transport people or things. There's, other, there's another reference I don't have in my notes where God is basically riding on cherubims. And then we have here where there's this, uh, this creature that the cherubims are kind of moving around and flying with. But then we also have references to when people die in Scripture, I believe they're carried to heaven by the angels, by cherubs, that they're literally taken up. The Bible says that no man hath ascended into heaven, but the Son of Man, you know, which is in heaven, John chapter 3, that... Jesus was able to, after his resurrection, ascend up into heaven of his own power, of his own volition. He's able to just go into heaven. And no one's ever been able to do that. Now, the scriptural references that I have for this are one in Luke chapter 16, verse 22, talking about the, the, the story with um, Lazarus and the rich man. And it says in verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So in this story, the guy that goes to heaven, the beggar, he's carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. He's carried into heaven. And this makes perfect sense, too, that, that you know, you can't get into heaven on your own. You have to be brought up there. We see um, Elijah's taken into heaven by a whirlwind, but it's, it's the chariots and the horses. It doesn't specifically say angels, but he sees these chariots and these horses, and I think it's easy to assume, as we're going to see later, we're going to turn to a story where um, these angels are protecting Elisha and Gehazi, and they're surrounded by chariots and horsemen. So, and they're being protected by angels. So it, it, it makes sense that the angels came. They took Elijah, Elijah up to, to heaven in a whirlwind. And then um, in Mark 13, verse 27, the Bible says, And then shall he send his angels, so this is talking about the rapture, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. So how, what happens at the rapture when people are caught up together in the air? Well, the angels are doing the reaping. The angels have the sickles. The angels are the one performing that action of transporting people up. Uh, Revelation 14 is another example that you don't have to turn there. Stay in Hebrews. We're going to go to Hebrews 1 in just a minute. We're going there next. 
Revelation 14, 17 says, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So, there's a lot of, just so you know, there's a lot of references I left out. I know I'm getting to a lot of places, but I had to keep trimming this. I had 10 pages of notes of all just scripture, like just copy and paste scripture, 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 scripture. There's a lot here on angels, and I'm, I'm trying not to bore you too much, but uh, I think this stuff is really interesting. And just, just seeing, you know, part of one of the purposes of the angels is to bring people to heaven when they die, saved people. They're commanded by God to bring them, bring them up here. And they, and they go and do that and they perform that. And we see they're going to do that at the rapture as well. Another thing though, and I think even more importantly, and this is what I'm going to spend the majority of the rest of the time on, and one of the purposes for this sermon as well, not just to clear up misconceptions, but I think it's awesome and we ought to be able to take a lot of comfort knowing specifically what the Bible says about why angels were created and that they're actually here to serve us, they're ministering spirits. And we saw that in Hebrews 1. We're going to go into it again. And God has given us this, um, these ministers to help us in our spiritual fight down here. We're in a spiritual war. There's a battle going on between good and evil. We're trying to follow the Lord. We're trying to do what's right. And God provides us with supernatural assistance. And that is pretty cool to think about. I mean, let that sink in. As you live your life and as you work and as you serve the Lord, God can send an angel to minister unto you, to protect you, to help you out, to look over you, to, to, to provide for you in your time of need. It's literally the messenger that God can send someone, an angel, to take care of you and protect you. And that's what they're for. We have so many examples of this in Scripture. There's no way we're going to get to all of them tonight. I'm going to try to blow through a lot of them just to show you and emphasize how much this is in the Bible. And, when I, and I didn't even realize this prior to the sermon until I really just started focusing on this one subject and digging into it. And man, this is encouraging. Because it's you all know the stories, but when you kind of pile them all together, you see this is happening. I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, references of angel after angel after angel after angel. And what are they doing? They're helping people. They're ministering to Jesus. They're ministering to other people. They're, you know, they're helping out in so many different ways. And this is very encouraging to know. That if you're going to, you know, the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Well, at the same time, God's got some angels that could come and help minister to you as well. Yep. So don't be too discouraged or, or feel bad about the persecution that's going to come because help can come your way. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1, look at verse number 1. We're going to reread this passage. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And before we get into the, the main point that I've been wanting to make, and I started making already, I have to bring this up. The angels are not sons of God. And, you know, I can go off and, and preach a whole other sermon and go to Genesis 6 and go to Job and go to other places because people have, have false doctrines out there where they think that angels are considered the sons of God, and they're not. We have very specific passages in Scripture that say, like John chapter 1, but as many as received him, them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. No other creature in all of creation is referred to as a son other than human beings. 
Now, there's one Son that's the only begotten, Jesus Christ. And then there's adopted sons, everybody who is in Christ that can, you know, we have the spirit of adoption whereby we cry unto the Father, Abba, Father. And we are born again and we become children of God because we believe on his name. But nowhere, no time has it ever been said, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee to an angel, to that creation. And if you think about it, just because a creature is a creation of God, that would mean that an ant is a son of God. That would mean that a cow is a son of God. That would mean that that tree is a son of God or what, you know, however you want it, to. It doesn't really make any sense because it's, it's a creature. Now, granted, angels are maybe more cognitive creatures, right? They're, they're more advanced. They're actually above human beings. They're powerful. They're mighty. But it wasn't given unto them to be sons. It wasn't given unto them to be in Christ. It's a completely different world for angels. See, we live in a, in a state, in a condition on this earth where, you know, we sin, we've got the wrath of God abiding on us, but we can receive salvation through faith in Jesus Christ who paid for those sins. The angels don't have that. God didn't set up a plan for their salvation of believing in Jesus Christ. They know Jesus exists. They, don't, they, they can see it. That's a different system for them. And we may not even fully understand everything about that system, but basically God has reserved hell unto the angels that sin, unto Satan and, and his angels. They don't have the chance to put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. They never can be born again. They are, they are what they are, and it is what it is, and God's righteous for doing whatever he does with his creation. And we don't need to worry about what happens with them. But we do know this, they're not the sons of God. And when you're looking at scripture, it doesn't even make sense to call them the sons of God unless you're trying to make something else, some other doctrine fit. Where you have, you're forced to make them be sons of God. But when you just take the scripture for what it says, um, they're, they're not the sons of God. And it's very clear about that. There's a very clear distinction between humans and angels and that, that they are not uh, sons of God. But let's keep going here. Verse number six, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, so this is now referring to, to the angels, and this is in the book of Psalms, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So this is specifically referring to his angels. His angels are spirits, they're spiritual beings. And his ministers a, a flame of fire, verse 8. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Um, let's jump down, verse number 13, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And that's the, the main point I wanted to drive in from Hebrews 1 here is that the angels are ministering spirits. They serve, they minister and they are specifically sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. What a great truth to just realize, hey, there's angels out there to minister for you. Now, there is, it's, it's hard to know exactly how many angels there are. There is a number given, but I'm not sure that this is necessarily explaining or telling us that these are all angels in existence. In Revelation 5.11, the Bible says, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. So in this vision that John sees in Revelation chapter 5, he's got the, you've got the throne, you've got the elders, and you've got the beasts, and he's seeing all this in heaven, and he says, surrounding all of that are the angels. And the number of the angels that are surrounding the throne, and the elders, and the beasts, is um, 10,000 times 10,000. That's 100 million. 
and thousands of thousands. So over a hundred million angels. That's a lot of angels. And that's just at that scene present at that time. In Hebrews 12, 22, the Bible says, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. So again, I mean, it, it doesn't say, that one passage doesn't say these are all the angels right here, but that's what he saw. It's a lot of angels. I mean, it's a lot of creatures. Well, there's a lot of people on this earth. And there's a lot of people at any given time that are going to be saved. So we see there's definitely an abundance of these angels in order to minister unto, I believe, individual people. And this is where the concept of a guardian angel comes from. Now, again, this has been taken and run with and kind of gotten, I think, a little crazy, especially when you talk about Hollywood and things like that. But I actually believe in the concept of a guardian angel. I think it's a biblical thing. One, we see that, hey, they're, they're made to be ministering spirits, that they're made to minister unto those who shall uh, receive salvation. They also see, we also see in uh, Matthew 18, turn to Acts chapter 12. In Matthew 18, 10, the Bible says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. This is Jesus speaking. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. There is referring to one of these little ones. One of these little ones has an angel in heaven. Now, we're not given more, con you know, more information than that, but that's pretty clear. He's saying, you know, they have an angel. They're ministering spirits. Amen. They're there to help out that, that person, that little one that believes in him. Amen. Acts chapter 12, we're going to start reading verse number 5. The Bible says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sad sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. <clears throat> what a cool story. This is a, look, this isn't just a vision or a dream because Peter actually thought it was. We're going to see that in the story. This is the Holy Spirit of God revealing unto us something that actually happened, a real event. An angel, Peter's in prison between two guards. I mean, they're trying to keep him tight. They're trying to make sure he ain't getting out. Why? Because the apostles already got out once before when they were put into prison. And they're saying, no, 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 we're going to make sure he's not getting out this time. So he's like between these guards, he's in the inner prison, everything else. This angel shows up, able to interact physically with this, with this world, right? He's a spirit, yet is able to make the chains fall off his hands. He's able to lead him out, open up doors, get him through, get him out, all these locked bars and gates and everything else, and just totally walk him through unnoticed, unseen, which it, it's, it's incredible. We, we don't understand it all. How could that even happen? What about these other watch guards? What about other people that are up? How is he going about being unseen? I don't know. But I don't believe that Peter changed shape or form or anything like that. I believe he was a human being just like anyone else would be. Somehow the angel might have been able to provide some illusion or something to you know, get him through. Whatever. Either way, and ultimately, how cool is that to know that whatever situation you're in, if God will, you can just be completely taken out of that situation that's going to seem entirely impossible by sending an angel to minister unto you and to get you out. And it doesn't matter what it is here. I mean, he's, he's locked up as tight as you think anyone can be, yet God sends an angel and he's out. Let's keep reading here. And it says, um, 
Verse 8, And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. So he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. He thought he was dreaming. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. So as soon as he realizes, okay, he's, got, he's a block away, he's safe, no one's after him, now the angel can depart, and Peter go on his way. Let's keep reading verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. So she's, you know, she sees Peter. She's happy. Like, Man, Peter's here. He goes right in, tell everyone else, leaves him out the front door. And they're saying, No way. It's not Peter. You're crazy. There's no way it's Peter. I mean, they're inside praying for him, but they're just like, there's no way he's just at the door right now. But look at what they say when she's like, no, really, he's here. They say, then said they, it is his angel. His angel. Not Peter's spirit, not his own spirit or something like that. He said, no, it's, that's his angel then. If you're seeing someone out at that door that you think looks like Peter ever, that must be his angel. Now, that's not the verse that's clearly saying we all have angels, but that's what they thought, and that's what they believed, and we already have Matthew 18 saying that the little ones do have their angels. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. And the time's going to fail me to get through all these examples. We'll get through as many as we can. As we recount these stories, hopefully I wanted to encourage you more and more and more when you see all these examples of angels helping people out. Luke 22, we're going to see angels ministering unto Jesus. Verse number 39, And he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. This is when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, right before his crucifixion. Verse 41, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Story sounds familiar, everybody? Yeah? Here's a story where we're mostly focusing on the agony of Jesus Christ being in this garden and facing this. And there's all these, all these great passages and verses about this. But look at verse number 43 and tell me if you even remember reading this before. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. It's okay to say I don't remember reading that. But it's there. And you know how many times there's, there's phrases like that and statements like that and stories about angels being there? Why? Well, because it's a real powerful story. So you focus on other things that, that may stick out a little bit more. But this is kind of wedged in there. Well, and then there appeared an angel and strengthened him. Because this is also the passage where it says here in the next verse, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We'll focus on a verse like that. We'll focus on what he says to the Father. But then Reg, right in between there, hey, an angel came in and strengthened him. In, in his darkest hour, in his time of greatest need on this earth, an angel was sent to strengthen him, just to, to, to give him the extra strength that he needed to get through and do what he needed to do on this earth. It's amazing. You could turn to, um, I don't know, turn to Matthew 26. I'm going to read Mark chapter 1, verse 13, where Jesus is being tempted of Satan in the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. In another gospel, it talks about where, you know, the devil, first he, he tempts them and everything else, and then when Satan leaves, then the angels come and they minister unto him and they strengthen him. He's just gone through a, a, a hard time, a, a battle against Satan, as, as it were, and angels come and minister unto him. Matthew 26, verse 52 
Jesus tells Peter here again um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, then said Jesus unto him, put up again thy sword into his place for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? He said, all I got to do is ask. I can just ask for those angels. I'm mentioning this to maybe help you in your prayer life. Amen. You've got some needs? Ask for an angel Amen. to help. And I mean that. This is, you know, the, the, the world can hear this and laugh their head off and think, you're nuts. You're praying for God to send you angels. And I am 100% serious. Yep. Believe this with all my heart. There are angels that God has created as ministering spirits to minister for us, to help us out. We need help. Believe. We ask things in faith and God will give it to us. Anything according to his will, he'll give us. Turn to, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. It's the last place I'll have you turn, I think. Yeah, 2 Chronicles 32. I'm going to read a few more stories for you. So, um, of course, in Acts chapter 5, this is what I was talking about when, in, in verse 19, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And this is when the apostles, were, it was more than one, there was you know, multiple apostles that were thrown into prison and they were let out and an angel freed, get, you know, did a prison break. John 5, 4, for an angel went down in a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, whosoever. And this is a really interesting story. The reason why I, have this, I left this in my notes, I wasn't going to bring this up, but John 5, 4 is removed from most of the modern translations. And if you know the whole story, it's, it's where all these sick people are, are sitting around this pool in Bethesda, I think. And, it, and it's just the pool of Siloam, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure if I have the, the details right. They're sitting around and they're all, they're all these diseases and problems. And they're waiting because it says here, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. So he made a stir in the water. And people would see the water stirring Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Kind of weird, kind of neat. I mean, it's interesting. Modern versions don't, don't have that verse. They remove that verse. What's really funny about that, though, is when you read the whole story without that verse, it doesn't make very much sense at all. <laughs> Just the story. Like, why are these people all sitting around this pool for what? What's the purpose? Well, this is the purpose. Like, that's the whole reason there. And because and, then the guys even, you know, Jesus is talking to him and he's saying, well, Lord, you know, when, when, the, when the water is moved, I've got no one to, to help bring me down there. Someone else goes in before me. And that's what he's explaining to Jesus. He's in this situation. Without that verse, you're going, why do you need someone to bring you down? Why are you sitting here all day waiting for someone to bring you in the water? You'd have no idea in the modern translations because he wants to be healed. <laughs> because, because this is what happens at this place as a result of an angel going down and troubling the water. Amen. But just a, another great example of the reality of these creatures, these spiritual beings, and um, how, they, how they can relate to us. Uh, Daniel, the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Guess how Daniel was saved from those, from those lions eating him up because they were hungry. You never believe this, but God sent an angel. Amen. Daniel 6.22 says, My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths. Remember we saw that the, the, the angels are, are strong, they're mighty and powerful. Yeah, they're strong enough to literally hold a, a lion's mouth shut. He hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before an innocence he was found in me and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Pretty cool. But it was an angel that was sent down to do that. Psalm 91 verse 9 says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. 
And this is the passage that Satan tried to uh, tempt Jesus Christ with to throw himself off the, off the tower, right? Just to, you're like, oh, well, God said that you're not going to get hurt, right? He's going to send his angels, so you might as well just do it. But this, is, but this is still a true verse. You know, Satan is obviously trying to tempt him, but he did give his angels charge to keep thee in all thy ways and to bear him up lest he would get hurt. That they, that's what they were there being charged to protect him with. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Amen. You're in 2 Chronicles 32. This is the story I was referring to earlier with Elisha and, uh, or no, excuse me, this is with Hezekiah. Elisha's coming up next. Second Chronicles 32, verse 19, the Bible reads, And they spake against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the hands of man. And for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos prayed and cried to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel, which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land and when he was come into the house of his God, they that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with the sword. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all other, and guided them on every side. There was a force, an army, that was greater and mightier, and they had no way of defeating. So they prayed unto God, and God said, okay, I'll send my angel. And you see what, I mean, think about there's the, the, the angel that went through killing all the firstborn in, in Egypt. You've got the, um, when, when David numbered the people and you've got the angel going through and killing people then too. And all those people died and he literally saw them with, with, his, with his sword stretched out basically ready to, to continue going. And, and there was an angel involved there too. Now obviously there's, Angels sent to do different jobs and different tasks. But um, here, it's, you know, we're reading all about these, this protection from the angels. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. This is the one I actually wanted you to turn to. But even in the story with um, finding a wife, Abraham finding a wife for Isaac, the reason why he was able to find a wife so fast is because there was an angel helping out there too. Genesis 24, 7 says, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. So you wonder how it worked out so perfectly. When Abraham's servant shows up and, he, and he's praying to God, going, God, you know, bless this trip, bless my master and his son, and, you know, help me, the, the woman that comes and, and she offers to drink for me and for my camels, and, you know, like, like let her be the right one. How, like, he's not even, he's, he's not even finished praying it, and all of a sudden, here she comes. How did that work out? God sent an angel before. And, and made it happen that she was going to be sent out and, and have this, this meeting happen. Well, that's pretty cool. If God's able to do that and send angels to do that, I don't know. I think I'd like to pray for some of my loved ones to be in situations where God can make their paths cross with someone who's a soul winner. My unsaved relatives. I would, that's a great prayer. God, can you please send somebody here to... to to make it so that their path is going to cross? Can you make it, send some angel to do this, to do that, to, to help out, to get, because this is the result I want, Lord. Can you help with that? Amen. Abraham was confident. Hey, God's going to send his angel and, and, and he'll make sure. Why? Because he's trying to obey everything. He said he can't go back into that land, but he doesn't want his son marrying the daughters of the land of the heathen. Yep. So I need, I've got a dilemma here. I need to get this problem fixed. You know what? God's going to help me out here. Because I can't send him back, but, but I could get him a godly wife. Yeah. And God said, yeah, I'll do that. That's a good request. And he sends an angel to help out. 
2 Kings chapter 6, verse number 15. The Bible says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So Elisha's here with his servant. Servant gets up early and he's like, whoa, he looks around and there's just this, this huge army just kind of surrounding him. And they were after Elisha because they were thinking he's causing all these problems and stuff. Like basically he's just praying to God and, and, he, and he's letting people know like, hey, he's letting the king know, hey, don't go over there. You know, you're going to get ambushed over there. Hey, don't, you know. So these people really wanted to get at Elisha and they find him and then they, they kind of trap him. And when his servant looks around, he's like, what are we going to do? Verse 16, and he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. He said, no, don't worry. Don't worry, God's got us here. You don't have to fear. You don't have to fear that there's just us two here and we're surrounded by an entire army because we actually have a lot more on our side. And then it says in verse 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. God sent a legion of angels to defend Elisha, the man of God, the man doing a good thing, the man doing a right work. God's able to protect him. He didn't have to worry. We could go into the stories. I'm not going to, we don't have time. Cornelius, here's from an angel. Hey, send for Peter. He's going to tell you what you need to know. Preaches the gospel unto him. Jacob wrestles with the angel. Zechariah talks. So the whole book of Zechariah, he's, he's having basically a conversation with an angel. Go through all these books of the Bible and you start to see angels, 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 and, all, and, and how much they're referenced throughout Scripture. It's pretty cool. Amen. Nothing that needs to be so mystifying. Now, we don't have to know all the details about absolutely everything, but God's given us a lot of information on what we do need to know. Yep. Take comfort in the fact that God has angels and ministers for us. We are supposed to be ministers unto others, and at the same time, even if no one physically hear like any other brothers and sisters in Christ minister unto you. Hey, you still got God to help you out and send a minister, a ministering spirit to minister unto you, a ministering angel still to help you. So you don't have to worry about getting burned out. Even if you're the only one and you have nobody to help support you physically, you'll still get physical support because God can send his angel to give you what you need to minister unto you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for caring about us so much that even though we are these lowly creatures that you've created, Lord, and, and we're sinners and we're not worthy uh, of being called a son, we, we thank you for the love that you've given us to adopt us as sons through Jesus Christ and that um, you, you've also gone as far as to use these other creatures, these other beings you've created to to serve and to help us out here because you know that we need help. Lord, help us to have the faith and to know and to um, just rely on you and to pray unto you, Lord. And, and I pray that you would please just give us all the extra help that we need. Help us to uh, be very productive in our soul winning. I pray that, that whatever angels that, that you've allowed to, to designate to help the people here, that that we can do the most to, to be ministers ourselves and to serve you and, and to bring the most honor and glory unto your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.